Hello everybody, welcome to the Eternal Spoiler Breakdown. My name is Pocho. Uh, we recorded a bunch of spoiler breakdowns, and we'll probably be trying to put those up in a different order than I normally do. I think I'm going to actually have to pre-record some options, because the way that spoilers have been released, there are different sizes and shapes of spoilers, and so the stream spoilers ended up being running pretty long, and also being a little bit more scattered than usual, just because we were uh, fighting with the like UI in terms of like getting all these images up on a live stream. So, but we are going to be breaking down today the third mechanic of the set, which is shift, and uh, putting that up. So yeah, uh, let's talk about shift, because that has finally been revealed. We finally know what it is. Uh, shift was, I think, announced three days before it was explained what it is, and that's, that's sort of the general theme of what shift is. So we have these cards called shift cards, or the cards that have the ability shift on them, such as phase out, which says choose a unit and shift it, or uh, there's a worm that has a shift for four, the Senwe smuggler has shift for three. Uh, all of those essentially give you the ability to shift a unit as opposed to playing the unit through normal means, or in the case of phase out, to shift a unit if it is already on the board. When a unit is shifted, it goes out of play, or rather out of phase in a certain way. Uh, let's go ahead and show that. So it'll look like this to start, and then over the next three turns, it will slowly go down and count until on turn three, it comes back out into play and is unblockable. When you shift a unit, you trigger its summon ability immediately, but uh, while it is shifted, it is immune to all targeted effects and cannot, be, uh, cannot attack or block. So it effectively just can't be dealt with or damaged in any way other than through uh, board sweepers such as Harsh Rule or widespread damage such as Hailstorm. So if you don't have good options that will like don't target, then you can't kill shift units. So by their very nature, they're pretty hard to interact with, but when they come out, they have that unblockability and they are therefore like going to be like a little bit more aggressive on that front. Uh, so units that actually have shift on them can be played for their shift cost. So if you see a card like Tremor Shocker here, then you will be able to play this card either for its six cost or you may will be able to shift it for four, meaning that you can play it out shifted, it will trigger any summon abilities it has, which in this case it has none, and then it will in three turns become a 6-6 six, six with unblockable that you can attack with that turn. So generally like pretty useful stuff, like this allows you to create unblockable damage in uh, pretty uh, in factions other than red and purple, which is really interesting, and allows you to add reach to decks that otherwise don't have decks. Cards like Tremor Shocker aren't going to be terribly powerful on their own, but they do provide you with a source of damage that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get across with in other formats. So playing mid-range time stuff with a card like Tremor Shocker allows you to basically just push extra damage across over your opponent in ways that you can actually like really helpfully interact with. On the other hand, when the card does come out unshifted, it is unblockable, but it isn't uh, necessarily immune to removals. So you can still annihilate it, death strike it, anything along those lines. And of course, because you are delaying this unit's appearance for several turns, you are sacrificing board position for uh, additional reach and additional ability to knock out your opponent and deal with stuff. So that's the general trade-off of Shift, but there's also some pretty great stuff that you can do with Shift. Uh, Tremor Shocker here is just like kind of an okay like draft card or a draft common that you can use to add a little bit of reach to your draft deck and give you a way to push across that extra damage at the end of a pretty long curve, or to create just a big unit in, later in the game to actually like help you out in the mid-range. But if you are playing a card like Zolta Loyalist in Ranked, um, when Zolta Loyalist comes out, it doesn't trigger a summon ability, but it has the ability that when you attack the enemy player with exactly one unit, it gets plus one, plus one. So this 6-6, six, six, you can shift for three, and then while it is out on the board, it is untargetable for three turns, and it is giving you the oath book effect. So any unit that attacks with a, a single just by itself gets a permanent plus one, plus one bonus in the same way that Paladin oath book would. So you can do this, like, say, with a Crown Watch Paladin on turn three. You can do this with Oni Ronin's and Oni Samurai. You can do this with basically any sort of small unit that you like. 
And then later on at the end, you'll get yourself a 6-6 six, six endurance that you only paid three for on turn six or so, which, yeah, that's pretty solid stuff. The main thing about Zolta Loyalist, of course, is that typically as a card that you are playing on its own, it's not like very efficient if you play it later in the game. This is actually more useful uh, in the early game than you would get it in the late game. And the shift ability is particularly handy because you get to swing out with that 6-6 six, six unblockable later on. And of course, because it is unblockable, it will probably be a 7-7 seven, seven unblockable, give you a decent amount of extra value. It's still okay to top deck, but it's not as good as, say, a Talute on board late in the game. Um, yeah, I think this card's recently decently powerful, although the fact that you have to play it on 3 means it can lead to some awkward tempo situations where you're basically establishing something that buffs up your Crown Watch Paladin, and then if your Paladin dies to something, then you're out of luck for at least two turns while you try to set up for Loyalist later on. So it can actually lose you tempo if your deck is not really well set up to take advantage of that Paladin Oathbook style uh, benefit. Uh, but it is a Paladin. You can bond it out for cheaper. You can do really interesting things with it. Uh, I think generally you're going to want to shift this card, but if you want to play it for seven, I think there are certain situations where that actually ends up being very good, especially in situations where you have double damage or some type of cool effect like Lifesteal to play with your other Paladins. You know, like a bright mace paladin or something along those lines uh finally like the other thing that's cool about shift is that cards like phase out and remembrance can allow you to use shift to effectively give you a little bit of uh time to play around cards you can phase out a unit to make it easier to block or make, make it easier to attack in you can phase out your own units to make them untargetable and use their abilities for later like if you wanted to like actually play down a talute and then phase it out you would have access to 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 Talute's active ability, but your opponent would not be able to interact with Talute in any way other than Harsh Roll, which would be you know, pretty effective for you. Uh, if you wanted to use a card like uh, this one's pretty decent for the flexibility option, but if you wanted to use one of your own units, you could also do Remembrance, a card that plays a unit from your void with a cost of three or less and shifts it, allowing you to access that unit's abilities, play its summon effects, and then get an unblockable unit later on. So you could also do it with something like Gorgon Fanatic or anything along those lines where you want to bring the card back from the void and then attack with it. Beast Caller, Gorgon Fanatic, all of the standard infiltrate things that you generally use Haunting Scream with. This card's pretty interesting. The art for it uh, is the same art as, uh, or the same woman as on Sleeping Draught. It's quite possibly um, Dara from the Horus Traver campaign. It's a little hard to tell because they're always drawn a little bit differently, but like basically the card's sort of synergy, or the card's sort of um, lore connection with the Shadowlands and with shifting would probably imply that's the case. It's a little hard to say for sure, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is pretty interesting stuff. Like, basically, Remembrance seems like it's going to be a relatively powerful card for allowing you to get some cool summon effects back over time and actually take advantage of those, like, really interesting Dark Return type effects. The cost three or less is obviously a pretty big restriction, but there are ways that you can actually make that happen and do some cool things with it. I wouldn't say that Remembrance is necessarily the strongest card in the world, especially since Haunting Scream exists and it can get back even bigger units that are much scarier, but this still has a lot of potential and potentially do some of the same things that Haunting Scream could do in uh, set one. So yeah, you got some interesting potential with that. Uh, yeah, so beyond that, we have a couple of other shift cards. We have Quake Titan, a card that when you shift it is specifically better than if you don't shift it. Uh, if you shift this card for seven, you can deal five damage to an enemy and then have a 5-1 unblockable later on, which is a pretty decent way to push across a lot of damage. Whereas if you play it for three, it's a pretty bad 5-1 unit. Like overall, this is not going to be terribly hard to kill. It will trade well with everything, but I would say that it's not like going to be the, your favorite thing to play on turn three most of the time. This has got some flexibility to it. I would say that it's decently strong as a like sort of draft bomb because you can actually use this card to create a pretty aggressive three drop that you can then support with removal and then you can use it as removal later on as well as use it to push damage later on and it represents a full 10 unblockable damage in terms of reach which is uh, decently cool stuff if you want to play with it in limited. I think shift cards in limited have a lot of strengths however there is also a very real cost to these cards in that you will lose tempo every time that you play them so it is possible that you will take a lot of damage for playing them in situations where you would not otherwise be able to do so so yeah it's it's crazy crazy stuff 
Uh, and this card, you know, as it reads, does only deal the damage if it shifts. So, oh, oh, uh, it's apparently been confirmed that any type of shifting shifting triggers this uh, Titan's ability. So if you wanted to use like phase out on Quake Titan, that would actually trigger the shift again. Uh, that actually it lends it a lot more usability in uh, any sort of setup where you are trying to basically phase the card in and out like it can actually allow you to repeat that damage over and over again and get a kind of gatling gun effect on your unit which uh, is a unit based strategy but is still some kind of cool combo that you can actually do some interesting stuff with which yeah that's definitely got some potential all right our final shift card uh so we know that that sun waste smuggler the three two four three is a shift card uh let me grab that real quick because i'm sure it's in here somewhere there it is uh, Senway Smuggler has shift, so our Merchant has shift here. Uh, this actually does make Senwastes quite a bit more dangerous than you would expect it to be. Uh, I've seen some people ragging on this card a little bit, but I would say that a uh, Smuggler that you can bring out that doesn't actually interact with the board and then becomes unblockable later on is actually really interesting. The other thing that's interesting about shift is that suspend type effects tend to generate what I would call um, swings in the board state, where basically you are behind... Uh, at a particular time, but then you, you can do something to stabilize, and then when the suspended cards or shifted cards come back into play, you can do some pretty wild things. So if you play out Senway Smuggler as a shifted card, and then like basically like set it up with some sort of big weapon that you can then later put in, uh, or like basically just trade for some big weapon that's going to be really, really good, like a door knocker or something nonsensical that's actually going to make Senway Smuggler be ridiculous, uh, and then like basically just spend the rest of your turns like sort of setting up for Senway Smuggler's big turn there's some potential there to actually get a really really big swing out of it and do some pretty cool stuff with it. I think Senway Smuggler is potentially going to be a surprisingly strong merchant based on entirely what we see in this set and what we see in the markets of Senway Smugglers but yeah this card actually has a lot of potential here to be one of the more powerful merchants just for its ability to both become untargetable and then when it becomes targetable do some very very bad things to you in ways that you might not really want. Uh, it is a card that can shift back into play, equip a very large weapon, and do all of that without ever allowing your opponent to interact with it with a targeted ability. So if that very large weapon has some sort of Aegis attached to it or some sort of way to prevent it from dying, if you're adding in like cards that actually like corrupt, that allow you to prevent targeted abilities from targeting send wastes after you have actually put the weapon on it, like there's some decent turn setups that you can do here where you can combo out and blow people up with Smuggler in some pretty disgusting ways. I think there's a lot of potential for this card. It's really going to depend on what cards are supporting it, but yeah, this card has got some awesome strength to it if you've actually got everything right. All right, so the last card that we should probably spoil as a shift card is Rost. Uh, we've talked about Rost a little bit, uh, but we're going to talk about him again. Rost the Waking Glacier has Overwhelm and Warp and the Entombability of Play Rost shifted. So that means that every time that Rost is played, uh, well, you can warp him, so uh, you can very easily get what you need out of uh, that whole setup. The card has Overwhelm, so it's pretty hard to deal with, and then whenever it entombs, it disappears for three turns, but then comes back again with Unblockable and Overwhelm, which means that it constantly pushes through for a big ol' pile of damage. I'd say this card is pretty ridiculous. It's definitely got some of the same like sort of Mokdo feel to it, where it is just always going to come back. It's always going to be irritating in control decks. Um, like, yeah, obviously there are going to be lots and lots of turns of downtime with Rost. Like, you will only have Rost one out of every four turns, but this is a kind of card that will actually run your opponent down out of cards over time, and is fairly hard to deal with on that front. Uh, and also because it pushes so much damage overall, like, yeah, there's some really interesting potential to do some pretty wild stuff with it. So, yeah, uh, anything that you can do with it I think is going to be pretty wild. Like, Rost is just a tricky card to blow up, and yeah, overall, seems like it's going to be very, very strong. So, yeah, seems like a very, very good card. That's it for our shift cards. Uh, so yeah, this is going to be pretty crazy set. Shift is 
a dangerous and scary mechanic, I would say. It's definitely got some of the most ridiculous potential in terms of, like, abilities to break the game. I trust Direwolf's design quite a bit, so I think that, like, this is going to be something that actually will be a lot of fun. I actually like suspend mechanics quite a bit. Uh, I'm okay with sort of phased mechanics where you actually have access to some, like, interesting new zones. I think that's going to be pretty interesting as well. Uh, the design on this has to sort of be better than phasing and suspend both, but uh, I I think it they might have hit a decent uh, nail on the head. It's really going to depend on like the entire set and how all of these cards interact with each other. And if they do, I think it's going to turn out to be some pretty fun stuff. So really looking forward to playing with this uh, setup. It's going to be really interesting to see how shift cards influence the meta and influence the overall gameplay. I'd say we're moving towards some slightly slower games, but also games that have more of a potential to end uh, with these big shift finishers because there's just like some really easy ways that shift units actually end games when they are supposed to which yeah that's really really cool stuff a lot of countdowns a lot of suspense a lot of tension uh it's a good feel and i think it's going to be pretty interesting to see so that's uh what's coming up in dark frontier thank you guys so much for watching i will see you all next time and uh have a really lovely evening